Right. Well, hello, welcome. Uh, this is DevOps CI's APIs of my security gone agile. I'm Matt Tassaro. I will be doing this presentation. Um, there's a bunch of stuff here. I have very information dense slides, um, mostly so that if you want to look at this later, you'll have the stuff. I mostly just use it to remember what I wanted to talk about. Um, and as I'm going along, if you have a question, just raise your hand, shout it out, throw coins a pound or greater. Um, I don't want to get hit by something that's in the P range. That's no good. Um, so let's get started. So who am I? I'm Matt Tassaro. I've been at Rackspace since 2011, October. Um, I'm in the Rackspace product security group, which is a group that lives in our product group, go figure, which is where we develop the various uh, OpenStack and other products that end up being sold to customers, right? Um, and at Rackspace with the product security group, we're kind of a, I don't know, we're, we're unique from my other positions where I actually report up through the QE or quality engineering chain. So where I actually live, our product security group lives underneath the VP of quality engineering. Um, so we kind of work hand in hand with the QE folks. That's my, my work side of me. The OWASP side of me, I was a board member, I think from 2009 till 2011, I think, or something like that. Um, and I've been doing the OWASP Live CD since 2008, which is now WTE, because I don't really do ISOs anymore. And I started an OpenStack uh, security project as well. So DevOps, CIs, APIs, oh my. So just, to, just so that we have sort of a common idea of what DevOps is, right? It's the idea that we're going to combine sort of or, or break the older mold of developers do code, they chuck it over a wall, and then ops has to somehow deploy this thing. And you have this adversarial relationship between the two, right? Let's all get along, let's all drink the Kool-Aid and be happy. Um, so it's a collaboration, agile um, experience, and the, the idea is really to sort of have each group sort of feel the pain of the other group, right? So that if, if the dev guys are producing code that's undeployable, they feel some of that pain. And if the uh, operations guys are, are making deployments really painful for the dev guys, they, they share that pain. So hopefully, in the end, we all get better, hopefully. And there's tons of automation and release coordination. That's a big part in my mind of DevOps. Okay, just so we have all the terms laid out. CI, continuous integration. CD, continuous deployment. But I've also seen CD be continuous delivery. Those are both kind of the same thing, depending on how pedantic you want to be. TDD, test-driven development, and APIs and application program interface, right? Just so that everybody has the same terms. Quick and easy stuff. So the problem. So the cycle time for software is getting really, really fast. Uh, Rackspace has a, a range of, of products in terms of speed and maturity. Um, the most aggressive of which is deploying last year on average 72 times per week, which is nutty. <laughs> Just flat bonkers. Um, and depending on the product group, some of them already have continuous delivery, some of them don't, where it's a spectrum, right, based on the product team and how sort of mature they are. And then for a security person who used to work in a much more traditional waterfall shop in a past life, um, the normal, like, this is my testing week doesn't exist when you're deploying 72 times a week. It's like, okay, let me, uh, my window's over. <laughs> right? So it's just not really functional. So. My first reaction was to say, no, 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 I need a week. We have to slow down. And that just won't happen, right? Businesses don't want to slow down. If nothing else, there's this huge first to market, first mover advantage, right? You may not have the best thing, but if you get it out first, you kind of grab market share and it's off to the races. So trying to talk to the business about slowing down is just, it's not going to work, right? That's not tenable as a security person, so um, that's just not a viable option. Oh, I've already said this, traditional software, a little time to test, right? And then you add in DevOps, continuous delivery, and you're even having more in CI, CD, and, and your windows and windows and windows are getting shrunk, 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 right? All of this is sort of working against you. Um, and then even better, at Rackspace, we have a lot of Ruby and Python. Those are languages that I can't automatically use a traditional static, analy anal pff, static analyzer to look at, right? Because static analyzers have no idea what to do with Ruby and Python. So once again, a place where I could maybe inject some automation, I can't. So it gets even worse. And then RESTful APIs, oh, that's the other one. We have lots and lots and lots of RESTful APIs. We don't produce waddles for those APIs. This is an open stackism. They don't like waddles for whatever reason. Um, so I don't even have a way to automatically talk to APIs. If I want to test a RESTful API, I have to read the docs, right? 
and test it. There's not a, in like in the SOAP world where you could pull a WSDL and maybe at least automati automatically make the default method calls. I can't do that now. So there's all these things sort of working against you. And you kind of feel like going down to the pub and just drinking and forgetting about it, right? And if you're trying to do manual testing, which it just takes time, that's even harder. So what do you do? Like automate everything. Automate the software testing, automate the infrastructure, and automate uh, automated security testing. I thought I worded that differently, but oh well, it's early. Um, so I'm going to talk through those three key areas. First from a design and principle point of view, and then I'm going to talk about what we've done to try to implement those things at Rackspace. So first things first, I would, I would challenge people who haven't been a developer. My first job out of college was at an international telecom whose operations were almost all in Europe, but the data center was in Texas, which was very strange to me. Um, but when I messed up, it was kind of nice because well, we were, had a lot of Belgian customers. Um, and so I would get woken up at 3 in the morning with a really angry Belgian yelling at me <laughs> in my bed. And it's like, look, okay, let me wake up at least. I know you're just getting up now, but I'm actually really, really asleep. And let me go to the office and we'll get it fixed. But so it, I would challenge people who are in the security, application security field, to think more like a developer. Like, think about breaking your, right? Because if you're developing an app these days, you don't do like the big waterfall thing where I have all my requirements and I go, you break it into pieces. So start thinking about how you can break the testing you do into little and preferably automatable pieces. Um, the other thing we do at Rackspace tons is threat modeling. And threat modeling is really nice because I'm time constrained, right? And now I have an overview of the system, and if nothing else, I can see the parts that look a little wonky or interesting, and maybe if I'm time constrained, I only look at the wonky or interesting parts, right? It's just very pragmatic, but it, is, it has served us very well. Um, and then think about the difference of like time of tests, right? Long and short running tests. Those short running tests, you can almost automate those in cron job those and have them just running weekly against infrastructure. Right? And then when you do actually do a, a formal review of a, a particular, in our case, product, you can look at the results of those cron jobs and have a good chunk of what would be manual testing done for you already. Right? And at first it's maybe you know, a couple days stale. But it's not, not bad it's already done. Um, oh, and if you write code for testing, it, it has to actually be performant. Because right? a lot of the code I used to write as a pen tester was just, it worked. Right? <laughs> I could make it work and it was good enough, but you kind of have to make it better if you're going to cron job it and rely on it reasonably. And then the idea of smoke test versus regression test, right? Find those tests that are quick and easy and maybe don't, they're not great security tests, but they give you a good baseline, right? Those ones just run all the time. And then when you really, really need to test something, do those long running regression tests. Ah, okay, so I'm going to repeat this since you didn't have a mic, and correct me if I get it wrong. So in Agile, you don't necessarily have the full threat model. How are you going to do that? Uh, Agile, you don't have the full requirements, so how do you do your threat model? How do you do your threat model? Uh, for us, the threat models are data flow diagrams, so at least, even if we don't have the full feature set, we know there's going to be an API and a work queue and a database and an et cetera, so we can get the flow out, even if the flow represents a small portion of the functionality of the, of the end state. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Perfect. And thank you for the question. Okay, I did all those things. So maximize what you've got. Like this is another place where you can make easy wins. Um, well, there's a, well, there's everything at Rackspace. I want to say there's a lot, but there's a lot of everything. But some of our groups are using Django to do their uh, web application development. Django has a configurable tool, uh, like a true false, I don't remember what the config option is, to turn on anti-CSERF tokens. Like this is a ridiculously easy way to get rid of CSERF, right? It's a look in the, the repo, if it doesn't have it on, ask the devs to check in a true or just do a pull request to make it true and you fix that problem. So a lot of this I find places, I, I used to be working in a .NET shop as well and there's tons of options in .NET to do good security. People just don't turn them on, so whatever you have, Really learn the framework. If you're lucky, you only have one or two. We have kind of everything at Rackspace. Um, but really, really understand those because you can get some big, easy wins. Um, tests need to be easily repeatable and easy to understand because we have 12 of us now in the product security group, but we're off, often shuffling between tests. And if I'm in the middle of testing product A 
and product B needs a retest, my, my coworker has to be able to pick up my stuff and go. And then abstract and combinable, right? This is the idea of the Unix pipe. I really love the idea of making lots of little, and I'll talk about this, lots of little tests and then combining them to get an end result, right? And that way you can mix and match depending on the context. So it's like SSL is a great example. SSL cipher checking. You need it for websites, you need it for APIs, you need it for a bunch of stuff. Make that its own little test. But I won't do, say, cross-site scripting tests for an API, but I will do SSL for both, right? So make those combine them all kind of Lego blocks, stick them together, and get what you need to get your job done, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question was, do you do, you do an entire, does the entire story have to be tested for you to be happy with it, or do you do 80%? I'll be honest with you, a lot of times we do 80%, because it's a, it's a, it's a time trade-off, right? If I can only get 80% done before it rolls to production, then it rolls, and I look at the 20% after it's in prod, because it's just, it's just how it is, yeah. yeah. You, you really have to be pragmatic, particularly with our more aggressive groups. And so that's another place where having these things combinable is really important because in the context of this particular product, these three tests are really need to make sure they're not messed up. You run those early, right? And then maybe those other ones that are interesting but not critical, if those run after they go to prod, that's uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you feel my pain. Yeah, it's painful. It was a, it was a rude awakening for me. Okay. So I and a coworker talked about this day of test-driven, instead of test-driven development, test-driven security, right? Where we have DevOps and CI and CD, your testing has to be nimble, you know, oh my God, I'm gonna say the A word, agile, right? So in TDD, the concept is, the overall concept is, you know your code works when the tests pass. For test-driven security, for me, you know you have a baseline of security when your app passed the tests. And baseline is a key concept, because there's a lot of security purists who will say, oh, well, that test only, you know, tests 50% of the possible SQL injections. It's complete and utter trash. I'm like, well, I tested the most common half, and I'll test the other half right after it goes to prod, and I'd rather have half of it tested than none of it tested. Right? So I, I have gotten very pragmatic in my uh, security thinking, quite honestly. Because if I didn't, I just wouldn't get anywhere. Oh, yes, it's a time to mourn, right? So in my mind, at least at Rackspace, traditional application security is dead and buried. Like, I, I did used to work at a traditional waterfall shop, and I was hand-in-hand hand with, we had an IV and V for was what we called our QA shop. And we had a two-week window where we did testing, and I tested at the same time uh, the QA people did, and it was, you know, yay, wonderful roses. Well, that's dead, for me, particularly. It's gone, right? And I, I would say, if you're in this place, I went through the five stages of grief. Right? I had denial, right? I like this agile, oh, that, I never said this really, but I know a lot of security people like, this agile thing is a fad, it's just goofy. You know, I, I used to joke that uh, at one place that I worked, we had sticky notes all over the walls. I said, like, one really aggressive cleaning lady and her development process is derailed, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I had another coworker who was really quite mean who would move them and then walk on. I thought, ooh. ooh. Anyway. So that's the stage of denial. I, I, that, I, you know, get over it. I'm sorry, Agile's here. I don't think it's going away. So anger, right? There's no way I can test that in that time frame. Like, and if I see another freaking sticky note, I'm gonna go nuts, right? Get, get over it. Like, it's time to not be angry. Bargaining, well, I can test two of it in two days, but I'm not really sure. And I, you, know, you kind of are trying to convince management to give me a little more time, please, right? And then depression, like after that launch, I'm gonna go update LinkedIn. <laughs> and then from aliens, right? Game over, dude, game over, right? Thank you, aliens. And then acceptance, right? Now you start actually talking with the developers and you say, you know what? I need you to work in a story to get this regression on this login thing. It's, it's not terrible, but let's get it in the, next, in the next sprint, right? Or like, hey, I looked at your de deployment recipe and I found some things that you were missing. You really should say, you know, put root no login for SSH. Why don't I, here's a pull request. Just add that into your puppet or chef. We're done, right? And that's kind of where you need to get. 
So I'm going to fly through these, uh, or hopefully we can fly through these five stages of uh, grief by talking about three different things. This is sort of how I broke it up for product security at Rackspace, looking at it from an infrastructure perspective, an apps and API perspective, and then the code. So let's talk about infrastructure. So I don't know where you are in your infrastructure automation uh, maturity model, but at Rackspace we have Chef, Puppet, Salt, and Ansible, depending on the team, which makes life interesting, because I sort of have to be an expert. No, I'm not an expert, but I know a lot of them, <laughs> right? But at, at first you're like, oh, God, I gotta know all this junk. But then I thought about it, and if, if I can bless how they deploy a node for an API and understand that that's hardened, that means that every node that we deploy is hardened. So this is actually a huge win. And it felt kind of weird at first, but it actually is fantastic. And I, I'm, I'm gonna go really quick over this, but for those who don't know the Chef's Puppet, all the, all the uh, uh, infrastructure automation stuff, they have this idea of a, of a sysadmin who has some sort of either hosted server or private repo that has recipes or salt stacks or what have you that know how to go down and deploy nodes, right? And there are cookbooks or stacks or playbooks <laughs> or whatever that go through and talk about, so I want you to set up an Ubuntu system, and if you do, I want you to do install autoconf, flex, and bison, right? Whatever, right? So they're just recipes that say do these things on a machine. I'm sorry? Honestly, at Rackspace, it depends on the team. Some of them, there's a really blurry line between devs and ops, and others, it's much more distinct. So it depends. Yeah. Generally, it has been the ops people. Um, the nice thing here is, right, you can grab a lot of these things and get decent baselines and kind of modify them to fit your work, so at least you can get some stuff out the door quickly. But to me, this is the place where I spend a lot of security cycles. Because like I said, if I can get this recipe that not only launches an API node, but an API node that is hardened and meets our requirements for a hardened node, I'm kind of done. Because I know every time they press go on this, right, it's going to go out consistently. Right? And then if you want to have good uh, karma points, try to get your, those hardening things merged upstream. Because a lot of the recipes you pull will make, you know, I don't know, Nginx run on a server, but probably not how you want it to run as a security person. right? And then grouping and tagging. So almost all of these have some sort of ideas of putting a tag or a label or some kind of categorization on the servers you're launching, right? So here's a DB server, and DB servers get MySQL, and there's a web server, and web servers get Apache, and there's a cache, and caches get mcache, right? So you tie these recipes into tags or some such thing, and maybe for all of them you have a monitoring thing, and every box gets monitoring, right? So there's this mix and match sort of category idea. Oh, now the interesting thing you can do is sort of map security tags to requirements, right? If you have a requirement to have your logs pushed off to a centralized logging server, well, that's like a recipe you write. And then you just mandate that that's part of your standard push, right? Good way to get some, some quick traction. Ah, and then the other thing that we've done somewhat at Rackspace, not entirely as much as I'd like, it's not done yet, although nothing's ever really done, is for each group and tag, we had this idea of, if you think about uh, deploying infrastructure, you have the idea of an architect, right? Or conceptually, this is the model we talked about, an architect, the person who designs the building, right? This is what the building looks like. And then you have the sort of construction company, the builder, right? And they go out and they build the building, right? So that's the guy who pushes go on the, on the recipe. And we have this idea of an inspector, right? The guy who comes in and with the checkboard and ticks all the boxes. Did you have, did you have, is the pipe, you know, this far, is it grounded, yada, yada. So we wrote an inspector that we can hook into the post-deploy system and do a review to make sure that that thing deployed matches what we expected. <laughs> so we have a, a little inspector, in essence, with a check, uh, uh, clipboard walking around ticking the boxes. I and mean, I'll talk about how we did this at Rackspace, particularly a little bit further down the line. And then this is where we're checking for code compliance, not perfection, right? This is another place where you're like, where are the bare minimums? Because it's, it gets very tricky to test certain aspects of deployment, but there are some that are just really easy, right? Is like directory indexing not turned on in Apache. That's really easy to check, right? So check that, right? 
And you can, uh, for me, I'm worried about security quite honestly, but you can also have multiple facets to this inspector, right? What about scalability, right? What about compliance? If, if this is a PCI environment, well then I gotta do maybe some more things than I do in a normal environment or less, so who knows, right? Okay, ah, agent, yes. One mole to rule them all. So uh, at Rackspace, I kind of, I would joke that I would come home from work and clean out my pockets and I'd find a server, right? Because we just, we have like infrastructure and cloud and virtual all over the place, right? There's just like popping a server at Rackspace is a non-event. Um, and so in this environment, we would actually have two uh, uh, dev or, or pre-prod production environments would come up, would be used for a deploy and they would just get destroyed, right? They just come up, you test them and they go. Um, so in that environment, you can't, a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the security tools have this idea of a mothership that you install and it sits there forever and talks. Well, that doesn't work when your environments come up and down like the wind, right? Because otherwise you're continually installing the mothership in the new environment, which is just a pain. So we're starting to use agents that are dropped on systems that can report back to a mothership that doesn't ever leave. But then those environments can come up and down. As long as that agent is part of a standard build, I'll get a mole, right, a secret agent in on the box that can then give me visibility in what's going on. And if they destroy that system because they're done with their testing or their pre-prod or what have you, it doesn't matter because their next one they build will also have that agent. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, reports to the mothership, I think I settled that. Oh, one other key facet, if you want to make your sysadmins or ops people happy, is make sure that agent is read-only, right? And, 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 and make sure that you can convince the sysops that it's read-only, because they don't like the fact that you're playing with their boxing. You look like you have a question, ask it. Okay, so the question, just so we have it recorded, was these agents, do you put them just in pre-prod or do you also roll them into production? And right now at Rackspace, I'm gonna do the lawyer answer, it depends. For some groups, we are rolling it all the way to production, other groups, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, we wanna to get to the point, though, that this is sort of just part of the standard. Um, because like when we had the, the Jenkins vulnerability that came out that was really ugly, I had wished I had had this, right? Because if I had an agent in all the boxes, I could just write a little rule that says, tell me if there's Jenkins running. They could all narc out the boxes that had Jenkins. You gather those IPs, find out who owns them, and go knock on heads, right? Yeah, it's, it, it really makes life much better. It, well, I'll talk about that later. There's a point I'll make later. But yeah, no, great question. And then ideally, right, add a quick and dirty dashboard to show these things, right? Like, for the Jenkins thing, if we'd had it, we could have turned everybody that had Jenkins red, and then as Jenkins got updated, turn them green. And I could get a quick visual representation of like, wow, we got lots of red, we got work to do. Or there's one or two, let's go find those guys and figure out what's going on. All right? Oh, you can roll your own. There's Mozilla MIG, which is actually more forensically based, but you could easily, I'm looking at tweaking that maybe to, to not do forensics. That's a Mozilla security project. Open source written in Go. Um, interesting agent. Their idea is to use the agent to find signs of compromise, you can give it a uh, hash of a problematic binary and then say, is, does it exist on the system? And so it's a sort of a way to forensically look out, but I want to change it to NARC, quite honestly. Um, Cloud Passage is another vendor that, that if you want to buy it, they have a nice agent-based system to do these kind of things. Ah, yeah, this is the next slide. You, you guessed my next slide. So, if you do this really right, you're almost turning vulnerability scanning on its head, right? Because it used to be you deploy your stuff, I run Nessus, I give you a report, this is what's wrong, right? One of the things we've done is, and I did this actually in a previous job as well, is I just subscribe to all of the, all of the things that we used, and that, at the previous job, that list was at least fairly finite, right? For all of the things that I used, I, I subscribe to the announce or the security or the, right, for that list. I got a Gmail account. And then I wrote some interesting filters, so if keywords showed up in them, it forwarded it to me. Right? So I made my own sort of uh, bailing wire and duct tape system to give me alerts when there were vulnerabilities in products I cared about. Right? And this um, is very useful because you can sort of turn the scanning on the head. Now you're not going, hey, by the way, I just did a scan and your thing's out of date. You can say, today, you know, uh, I don't know, Tomcat issued a patch and go check your Tomcat because I see from my agent that it's out, 
right? And I'm not having to do a scan to find that. I'm, I'm being told that, which is huge. Um, the other thing is we kind of cheat, quite honestly, in our threat models because we do data flow diagrams, a traditional Microsoft thing. But then I got the, the ops and the architects and the devs in the room. I pummel them with questions. What framework are you using? What language? What server? What, just get, get all that metadata you can because you have the guys for an hour or so. Like, why not pull it out? Um, I already talked about rolling your own, right? I did this at a previous job and it worked actually shockingly well, where I just signed up to a whole bunch of, uh, you know, vulnerability lists and then did some filtering. Uh, Secunia Vim has 40K plus products and they have a thing where you can say, I use this and send me an email and yada yada if you want to pay uh, for a commercial thing. And I just love the fact that it reverses that, that scanning thing. Right? You know, you're proactively helping the teams. Like, you don't have to have the fire drill because I finally got a chance to scan your infrastructure and, oh, God, this really critical thing is there. It's proactive. We can have a nice, calm conversation over, I'm in, I'm in England, so over tea, right? And talk about it, right? It's much better than the mad panic. Okay, let's talk about apps and APIs after I take a drink. Okay, so PDFs are great, but bugs are better, right? So I don't write reports anymore, which as a former pen tester is freaking beautiful. <laughs> and anybody who's pen testing here knows, like getting rid of doing reporting is, is, is the Valhalla of pen testing. Instead, I just do bugs now, and they go straight into the bug tracking systems over dev teams. And I'm in a backlog or an issue tracker, depending on how the team wants to do things, right? So I don't do the big reports. I, occasionally, I do for political reasons, but those are the exception, not the rule. Um, this is nice because then it's just a normal workflow for a developer, right? It's just another bug. You can go talk to the Scrum Master and say, let me get what sprint can we work this into? It's just, it's not a, here's this 500 pages of PDF, blah, like go make sense of it and come back to me, right? Um, ideally, you want to have a security category in whatever bug tracking something you have so that you can differentiate between functional and security bugs, and also you can run numbers about what your program is doing. Um, and the bonus points if your tracker has an API, because ours does and we've automated this. So I just push bug and it whoop into a backlog, which is beautiful. Um, I said it's part of the normal work log. One thing to watch out for is uh, for the more reticent teams, they might say, oh yes, we've got that in our backlog. And by the way, we haven't looked at our backlog in eight months. <laughs> right, so you do have to sort of keep them honest. Um, a lot of times I've had good luck sort of talking scrum masters into doing occasional security sprint. You know, hey, you kind of got a lot of security bugs in here. Why don't we take a two week window and just knock all these out and I'll stop bugging you and life will be good for you, right? And a lot of this is learning how the team treats issues because we have lots of diverse teams and for us at Rackspace, it's, it's all over the place. So you kind of have to know how to speak their language. Um, regrettably at this exact same time, Dan Cornell is talking about thread fix, which is a nice way to get metrics um, out of your bug, security bug tracking, as well as pumping them into issue trackers. So ThreadFix has this idea of pulling in vulnerabilities from multiple sources, sort of normalizing them, and then wiring them into bug trackers. And so what we did at first is we would just put them directly into the bug trackers, but then Scrum Masters and stuff would move them around and we'd have to go, oh, it wasn't the backlog, now it's in an issue, now it's in a sprint, like, where is it? Um, so we made our own. This becomes a security sort of source of truth that integrates with the bug tracking system. And the nice thing with ThreadFix is it'll let you know that it got closed in the bug tracking system. So I can look in ThreadFix and say that thing I reported last week just got closed. Let me go talk to them and make sure it's cool that we can retest. Whoops. I found the screen. Ah, yes. Nag, nag, nag. So the other thing we did is for each, we came up with a five tier uh, risk or severity classification system, right? Standard thing. No big deal there. But the one thing we did is we put an SLA to each severity, and then for the SLA, it's not getting it fixed, it's getting a remediation plan in place, right? Which gives some flexibility, right? Maybe this is a really horrible issue, but because it's a design fault, you can't do it in seven days. I mean, just physically impossible, right? So, okay, let's get a plan within 24 hours to know that the team's going to start working on this and we're going to do this mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. So our SLAs aren't based on being fixed but having a remediation plan in place. Once we have that in place, now I have something I can sort of put a line in the, in the sand and wait till we get there and then go talk to the team, right? How we, we're a week out, how are we doing? That kind of a thing. 
Um, yeah, we made it for fixed age. And then what we've also done for, for less uh, aggressive teams is in our source of truth, we start aging these, right? We don't have a fix yet, and we should. So let's do a, hey, you're a week out. We just send a little gentle reminder to the project manager. And then maybe a day or two out, we send it to the project manager and the director. And we just start walking up the org chart. And it's highly effective the higher you go, right? Um, not the, I mean, I, I'd like to work with carrots and not sticks, but sometimes you have to have sticks. Um, but once again, if you can do uh, some kind of dashboard for your metrics, this is great, right? Because then the manager can go, why does this one product have the big thing in the chart and not everyone else has little things? Um, and for the NAG tool particularly, when you start walking up the org tree, I would want some executive cover fire uh, because some directors get really grumpy if you start sort of showing them out. Right? So make sure the directors are happy with you nagging people. Yeah, it, it, that, that's unfortunately part of life. The, the question was, do you have the, the thing where people say, yeah, this is not that big to fix, but we're not going to it, we're not getting to it, we're not getting to it. That's kind of the death by backlog thing I alluded to. And yeah, that's, that's part of the, sometimes that's, you know, solved at layer eight, where you go just have some nice conversations with people and twist some arms. And sometimes you can just go down to the, the devs and go, look, man, I'm bugging you, you're sick of me. Like three lines, you check it in, we do a pull request, we're done. Right, let's just, and, and I've like stealthed into sprints, fixes, because it's like, I, I'm gonna keep talking to you, so you could like get rid of me for a long time if you just do three lines of code. Right, done. Okay, ah, so reports equals findings plus automation. So what we've done is actually standardized on ASCII doc, but pick what you want, pick a markup language, right? Because if you're a tester, you probably are fine using VI or Vim or, a text editor, Sublime, or whatever, right? You can just quickly knock these things out in text. A simple markup. And then you can use something like Pandoc or ASCII-Doc has it built in to convert those to HTML if you need a web report or PDF if you need to hand off a PDF or whatever you want. So when I write a finding, we actually write the findings, well, initially we've, we've improved on that, but initially we wrote the findings in a markup and then multiple people on the team could all write findings and the report was glue all the findings together and ship it off to the person. If they wanted it as a HTML, great. If they wanted it as PDF, great. If you wanted it as a doc, great. We can gen all those. Uh, you depends. Yeah, it, the question was, is it tagged to a story? And it depends, quite honestly, because it, uh, somebody asked me what time, what languages do you have at Rackspace? And I said, can I tell you what we don't have because it's shorter? Um, so yeah, the teams are very diverse. Oh, but the nice thing is, right, your testers are writing the least as possible, right? I have boilerplate, and you can take, if you have the stuff in uh, easy to parse um, format, you can take out and sum up numbers for them, like why is somebody counting the number of highs? Like that's something a computing pro program can do, right? The other thing we did is started reusing these templates, right? Because your first cross-site scripting finding, where you say reflected cross-site scripting is blah, 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 is like the 400th one. that. Reflective cross-site scripting is blah, 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 it doesn't change. Like, why am I writing that more than once ever in my life? So we've templated that, and every time we have a new finding, we can actually make that a template, and then the next time it comes around, I don't have to type it again. <coughs> oh, and this is, yeah, we, we started with Dratus, which was good, except for it didn't enforce uh, correct syntax, so you try to glue these things together and the parser would break. We've now written a web app where they just enter them in as individual form feeds, and then they're atomic and I can mix and match however I need. Yeah, I, it is a problem. I mean, you sort of have this growth of, the question was, do you find that you have a whole bazillion templates? Yes, one thing we did with ours is that as a, one of our tester guys will go find something and say, I wanna, you can create a finding that doesn't become automatically a template. But if you think it's useful, again, you can make it a template. Those go into sort of this pending or purgatory of templates, and then myself or a couple other senior people will go in and look at them, make sure the spelling's correct and the wording's good, and then we'll bless those. So we sort of have a, the, the, a lot of times the, the purgatory gets full, uh, <coughs> but you have a, but what you actually see in, in you know, for day-to-day for -day use is small. 
I had the same thing at a different company when I was pen testing. We had like, which of the 4,000 templates do you want? And like 17 of them are cross-site scripting. Like, ah. Okay, cool, settle that stuff. Uh, oh yes, leveraging existing consistencies, yes. So what does this mean? This is, this is best done by example. So I mentioned earlier that OpenStack has a allergy to waddles, right? We do no waddles. So if I'm testing, and guess what? Rackspace has lots and lots of OpenStack and lots and lots of RESTful APIs, which is a problem because every time I have to test them, I have to read the docs and at least get code or something that knows how to talk to it before I can even start testing, <laughs> well, at least when you're dynamically testing. So one of my coworkers, and props to him, realized that the docs that we produce at docs.rackspace.com are computer generated which means they are consistent, which means they are rather parsable. So he wrote a little bit of code that goes to the docs, pulls that down, parses it, and makes stub code in Python for all of the method calls. So in essence, we made the docs into quasi waddles. And now I can say, I'm testing Swift, point it at the Swift docs, run the tool. The code doesn't work, but it writes you know, 40, 50% of it for me, and I just have to fill in some bits, and I have working code. Really sped us up like crazy. Um, oh, I talked about this already. We automated finding and bug submission. Initially, at the first gen of this, it was literally just I had a bit of code that I could take a finding and push it into a tracker, and then we actually met, started using uh, ThreadFix, right? And now that's even more automated. Automatic PDF for generation, I, because we're using ASCII doc, and it has a thing, I just ASCII doc dash F PDF, wham. Um, I, I talked about this. Oh, the other one was, Another one, oh, that was an interesting one too. But well, there's another great one that one of the apps, one of our web apps had a bunch of reflective cross-site scripting, right? What do you do? Well, 15 minutes, oh my, I'm gonna go fast. What do you do? You go fast. Um, he actually just made a static web page with clickable links that exercise the cross-site scripting and hand it off to the dev team. Like, until these things don't have alerts, you know, don't come back to me. And we write a lot of scripting automation too, like I found an issue with an API and I wrote a little bit of Ruby, handed it off to the dev teams and said run this so that at least when they come back I have a fairly good assurance that it's fixed. Whew. Securing code. <coughs> oh, yes. Yes, one big thing with the, for my team particularly, findings have to be detailed enough that if I read your findings six months from now I can understand what happened, right? Because if nothing else, the developer is going to come back to me and say, I don't even know what this means. And if I can understand your finding, we're all kind of doomed. And I don't have to retest it. A lot of times we can actually get QE to do this retesting for us, depending on the nature of the vulnerability. If it's easy to produce and the tools that they use. And this can allow developers to fix the issues. Oh, yeah, and I've already talked about these. Actually, there's a reflective cross-site scripting one. And uh, script abuse via an API was the thing I mentioned, the Ruby script, right, where I just automated that little bit of it was a particular post that, that the API didn't like. I just wrote a little bit of Ruby to send the post, right? And then Gauntlet is an interesting tool to do uh, sort of test-driven security, uh, repeatable small testing, which I quite like. And then once we, these findings started flowing, I was actually getting requests, can we do developer training? Like, well, yes, we can. I want to make my job harder. Well, I don't, but I do. Oh, and then cherry pick what you look at. I talked about threat models earlier, right? Focus on those weak and suspicious areas. You know, connections to external systems, uh, any kind of transformation, if I'm going from JSON to XML or weird parsing, right? Those are usually areas that get tripped up, right? Then you can, if, in your automation, do commit hooks for those areas of the code. And in OpenStack, they have this idea of plus two to accept a commit. We'll make it a plus three for those particular bodies of code, right? Because now I want three eyes looking on it. And by the way, if I have a commit hook, I can also be alerted and decide if I need to look at that, right? Which is a huge thing. Um, oh, and yeah, like, I mean, just using, we have an internal GitHub, an enterprise GitHub account, just the search inside of that has been fantastically useful. And then we've, we've just started to, and this is a key thing, develop a list of problematic things, right? And it just is designed to grow organically as we find these things, right? I, I will never have the list, but I have an ever-growing list. That, yeah, so the, is there fighting about the plus three versus plus two? Yes, but luckily for our developers that do OpenStack, they're sort of used to that, so that wasn't much of a hard sell. Oh, okay. 
Because that just, in, in OpenStack proper, if you commit, you must get a plus two. So, uh, you know, internally making it a plus three wasn't a hard sell. I got lucky in that regard. Ah, no false positives, right? So one false positive is worth probably 100, if not 1,000 valid bugs. Like, never, 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 this is by beat on my team, give a false positive to a team because cred points are really hard to get. As a security person, you're already kind of hated, quite honestly. So if you give them a reason to hate you, guess what they will, right? And quite honestly, if you're not verifying false positives, what, are, what better are you than a monkey that clicks next five times on Nessus, right? This is just your, your value add is the fact that I can only give you actionable items as a security professional, right? Um, oh, and the differential analysis, and I sort of talked about this on the code thing. Threat model plus scary parts plus code diffs, right? Let me focus on the areas that are really, really scary. And there's some stuff that I'm just never gonna look at. You change the CSS of a website, I don't care, right? You change the login, I, I do care. Can you say that again? I didn't catch it. Yeah, a lot of times what, what we've done is just do commit hooks. And, and so I can, I can quickly sort of scan and see if this is even worth my time, right? I can take a two minute break and go, ooh, I need to actually cut some time up for this, or no. Because more of it's just like, I need to be alerted about what I need to know about and be able to filter quickly. Uh, and quiet is better than wrong, right? Hire and befriend develop developers. That's one of our, our guys have to have some sort of development experience if you want to work on our team, 10 minutes. We'll be okay. Speak their language. A big thing for me is suggest requirements, not implementations. For example, uh, this is at a former position, but the guy who was in charge of compliance would tell the teams, you must install Tripwire for PCI. And I'm like, no, they must install host intrusion detection. Like if it's something else, it doesn't matter, it still meets it. So don't think about a specific implementation, think about a requirement. If nothing else, developers like being creative, and you've given them the opportunity to be creative if you say, it just has to do this. You figure out how, and I'll evaluate if it's good enough, right? And then we're all fine. Um, yeah, mitigation suggestions should be generic or in the language it's written in, like don't give a Java example to your Python guys unless you want to be snickered at. Um, and then the other thing is like fast deploys also mean fast fixes. Some of the groups, when I'm testing them, I will find bugs and we're, I'm on IRC with them and I'm like, hey dude, I just did this and this happened. And they're like, oh man, that's bad. And they're like, okay, it's fixed. I'm like, I didn't even run up a finding yet. Like, well, yeah. So it is kind of good. Yes, sir. That, no, it, it, you, the question was, do we have every one per team? We want to get there, but we don't have enough people. That's really what it boils down to, yeah. We, that would be the ideal case, but we just don't have the bodies. Because then I would really, really know the product. Right? And now I have to sort of be schizophrenic and really know Nova while I'm testing it, and then I have to forget that and really know something else. Yes. Yeah, be prepared to really quickly test, uh, test and re-verify. Because if you have these guys that before you can write up the finding, fix it. Because yeah, I literally have written up findings, put them in the bug tracker, and close them. Because <laughs> they're just that fast. Okay. In my last few minutes, I'll quickly do what Rackspace is doing. <coughs> right, we, I've already said that we have Chef, Puppet, and, and Chef, depending on the team. We review the deploy scripts, we validate them with the external vulnerability scanners, and they sort of get blessed, and we watch for commits. Um, we watch for commits, and then if we have to have them make an adjustment, where we scan, right? We use Cloud Passage in a lot of our deployments. Uh, and we also have a custom mole that we write for certain situations, right? It kind of depends. Cloud Passage does a lot of nice stuff. It's not bad. Um, and it saved me from having to write a lot of code, to be bluntly honest, time-wise. And we've done tons and tons of threat models. And actually, one of my guys, uh, we have 70-some odd threat models of all the interconnected systems. And he actually made this giant map in HTML of all the system names. You can click on them, it takes you to the threat model. And then inside of there, the external threat models are also hyperlinked. So you can actually walk through all of the infrastructure, which has really been super helpful. Uh, product security workflow, we have somebody finds a finding, they document it in our test tracker app, that pushes it into ThreadFix, ThreadFix pushes it into the bug trackers, right? And then we have all of the metrics driven off of ThreadFix. So we've sort of automated that whole workflow. Yes? Uh, 
It would, yeah, like, like Rackspace, it varies widely. I mean, it, it can go from just running Nessus and verifying false positives to doing a manual test to you're doing a SAML integration, so you write your own little SAML client and, and just play with it. So it's kind of the range. Most of it's manual now because we've automated a lot of the automatable things. Um, but it could be that, that, like, we use Veracode for static analysis, and we've integrated with their API, and I pull down issues, and they go into the same workflow. So the issue may not even be technically found by us, it may be found by somebody else. Oh, yeah, we've had to re-implement the NAG script because of a, we had a minor change to the workflow, and I already mentioned this. We're using ASCII doc as our markup language and then converting that to what we need. Do, do, do. Yes, I just said this. We use Veracode, which is nice for us because it's self-service and binary, right? Just upload your binary and go. Unfortunately, they don't do dynamic languages, so there's a lot of stuff that gets missed for us. We have a Jenkins, uh, we actually commit, we have an open source Jenkins plugin that uploads into Veracode and then we gave that over to Veracode and they're keeping track of it now. I mean, we did API automation to pull in those findings and they just become part of our workflow. Um, I've already talked about this. We do detailed finding blocks and we, for int more interesting issues or if we've had to script it anyway, we take out that script and hand it to the dev teams. Five minutes, good, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Um, if we can scan it, we hook it into Veracode. So now some teams, it's I have to pester them every quarter to do it. Some teams have Jenkins, right? So there's a range. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Oh, we hold trainings. We have e-learning modules. We do work with devs daily. A lot of times we are going to the stand-ups, particularly when we're actively testing our new product launch. Those are times that are kind of super critical. Um, and we do have dev days, which is really nice. So Friday afternoon, afternoon, we all get up from our desks, go hide in a conference room, and we're knocking out automation tools for our team. Because if you don't carve out that time, you will never, ever do it. And so that was a huge win for us. Key takeaways, like automate everything. And if, you haven't, if you're not doing a lot of this now, just find paper cuts. And like get rid of the annoying things first, right? Um, figure out a workflow and standardize on it. That's been huge for us because now we have this sort of standard workflow. I just keep adding in tools. Like we have AppScan and I figured out how to parse the god awful AppScan XML and shove it into our workflow, right? So now I can take those findings from AppScan and boop, off it goes. Uh, create systems that should go, grow organically, right? You will never, ever finish. Ever, 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 ever. But if you make it so that you can keep adding things easily, this thing can grow over time and become even more functional. So maybe the first time I have it, it does 5%. And then a month from now, it does 20%. And then three months from now, it does 60%. Well, that's better than never starting or trying to get to 100% before I use it. And I've already talked about reusing finding blocks. You don't have to keep rewriting the same boilerplate junk. And learn to talk dev. That's important, right? Dev or DevOps. Whoever desires constant success must change to con his conduct with the times, right? That's, I couldn't believe I could fit a Machiavelli quote into a uh, AppSec talk, but I got it. Yes. I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I made it on time. Look at that. Whew. It was close. I thought I had more slides than I did. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Well, yes and yes. So how long did it take to get to that stage and do we make a lot of mistakes? I've been at Rack since October of 11. I moved over into product security in March of 12. So that long. <laughs> right, yeah, it takes a long time. And I'm, we, we originally, like I said, tried to drop things directly into bug trackers, but then people would move them. And so our sort of pointers into the bug trackers would be broke. And I have to go find them again. So that's why we made our own source of truth. So, oh yeah, you'll learn all kinds of things and bust your knuckles, absolutely. Other question? Yes? Uh, so yeah, no, that's true. Uh, no, uh, that that's an interesting gap and we've struggled with that in all honesty. So I, if I know that their puppet is good, I can be fairly you know, uh, uh, confident that the, the, the second one will be good, but a lot of times what we'll do is on a, on a quarterly or maybe biannual basis, just do a rescan of everything of that product. 
from Anessa so that you can find drifts. The other thing that we really like is hooking the uh, code repositories of where the chef lives. So if they make a change, I can go, oh, this is now drifted. I need to go look at it again. Because a lot of it is just getting alerts and then getting, you know, making a, a like, okay, now I know there's an issue. Do I need to care about it? And you can quickly sort of decide. Any other questions? Going once, going twice? Yes? Yeah, um, I, in, I'm not a QA person or a QE person. I was using regression testing, well, let me put it this way. I don't want to speak for our QA, QE group. They're, they're quite mature. Um, and they do do regression testing. And that gets really interesting when you do things like launch servers, because like how, how deep do you go? Um, but for, uh, for me, and in a security perspective, I consider a regression test a long-running test. So I, to me, it's more of like a very thorough, almost a manual test would be a regression test, like a manual pen test would be a regression test. Because you can't just fire it off and forget it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much.